Greetings, this is Top Hat in Buttered Popcorn. My name is uh, John Savers. I'm your host, and today we'll review a recent film, Saving Private Ryan. This film was directed by Steven Spielberg. It had music by John Williams, uh, photography, Janusz Kaminski. Stars uh, uh, Tom Hanks as one Captain John Miller, Second Rangers. Uh, Matt Damone as the James Ryan, Private uh, 101st Airborne in this film. Uh, they have um, uh, Tom Sizemore as a sergeant. Um, uh, we have uh, Barry Pepper playing a uh, uh, Jackson uh, and uh, basically a large cast of uh, uh, supporting actors uh, who uh, do a pretty good job, um, uh, a strong job actually, because in this particular type of film, uh, the uh, the cast, the relationship of the uh, individuals is uh, very important. Um, uh, no war film can ever be great because there's just not enough time to develop the character sufficiently uh, to make it meaningful. Um, therefore, Watching a, a war film just in and of itself is hardly more interesting than watching a demolition derby uh, plus uh, an automobile chase. Which which car passes the line uh, uh, first for the uh, victory uh, is uh, a minimal importance to most people. So the relationship of the people is quite uh, important. Uh, and uh, this particular film broke no ground in this regard, although the acting is strong. And uh, in the case of Tom Hanks and uh, Barry Pepper as Jackson, uh, I thought quite strong, um, uh, outstanding. Uh, uh, we um, I have a, a, an understated but strong performance, I think, by Tom Sizemore as a sergeant. Uh, and I think the fellow who played Mellish uh, did a, a very good job also. Uh, the guy who played Oppum, um, I thought was credible, and the whole group was uh, uh, credible in this regard. Uh, however, um, I did not consider this particular film exceptional in any way. Um, everything which uh, has was presented has been presented in other war movies, uh, and uh, so uh, in this regard, what is exceptional is the special effects depiction of carnage, uh, battle uh, wounds, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, atrocity horror of war, uh, the, um, the guts of it. Uh, in this regard, it was quite, quite good. Uh, and in that sense, uh, uh, a very good anti-war uh, vehicle. Um, now, this particular film is helped, I think, by Williams' music, which also I believe to be uh, categorized as a sort of understated, a dirge, somber, and so forth, occasionally uh, giving a, a kind of a color to simulate the feelings of the individual, such as a, a pronounced heartbeat type of uh, sound or something of this kind. Now, um, the uh, photography. I thought was um, uh, generally pedestrian. There were some excellent shots, uh, memorable shots. Uh, one of the memorable shots being uh, the troops sort of silhouetted against a gray uh, background uh, walking across a, a hill, a, a high piece of turf, uh, and in the background uh, exploding uh, demolitions, bombs, and so forth. Uh, it's a good scene. However, it's been used before. Um, the um, uh, uh, it, it's such a good one, I'm surprised it's not used more often, but um, uh, uh, it was even used in a horror film, uh, Frankenstein meets Wolfman, uh, to good effect. But uh, at any rate, uh, uh, although there were good shots, and I, I think the, um, the set designs for the uh, uh, bombed out uh, uh, villages and whatnot uh, seemed quite real and, and so forth. Um, uh, all in all, it, it is not something that uh, is remarkable, so um, we'll go on and say that um, for the camera work, uh, I, I thought the camera work in some places was really remarkably bad. 
uh, quite shaky, and um, I don't think you can put this down in any any valid way as uh, an attempt at cinema verite, um, but uh, basically uh, uh, some kind of slip up uh, on the part of the uh, production uh, staff. At any rate, uh, the film opens up with a picture, a depiction of old glory flying in the wind. Uh, the sky is bright and sunny behind. You, you see, therefore, a um, old glory which appears to be faded and the colors seem to be almost gone in the bright light. It's particularly noticeable, uh, I think, that the red seems to be all gone, almost as if uh, it's been all drained away. It's, the flag almost looks lifeless, devoid of the blood, uh, the, uh, the color that um, uh, gives it vigor and so forth. And hence, uh, this uh, depiction of the flag seems to be itself something of a statement, uh, um, perhaps the death of nations. At any rate, um, uh, the uh, camera cuts from this to a depiction of uh, uh, a good-looking, uh, handsome piece of turf uh, overlooking the sea, the sea being rather slate-looking, uh, uh, going toward the horizon. Um, uh, the uh, land is uh, a bluff, apparently. The grass is verdant. There's a line of trees, uh, a walkway. We see an older fellow kind of shuffling ahead along, uh, apparently going uh, in a determined way and uh, as quickly as his old legs will take him. Behind him, uh, some 20 yards, uh, a gaggle of people. Um, uh, it does not take too long to uh, figure out there's a relationship here uh, and uh, we quickly figure out that this is the family. The man uh, continues leading, uh, we get uh, a picture uh, of uh, the other side of this uh, land and uh, we see rank and file, endless it seems, of white uh, crosses uh, uh, every once in a while broken by the intertwined uh, triangles associated with the Jewish creed. Uh, the man keeps on going, breaks into uh, the lines and the rank and file of crosses and so forth, apparently looking for a particular name. Uh, he, uh, his family follows after him. Uh, he does come to a uh, familiar name apparently and uh, begins to break, uh, sob. Uh, he um, uh, kind of crumbles to, to the ground, crumples, uh, goes to a knee. Uh, his family comes up behind him. Uh, trying to console him. Someone says, uh, one of the people says, Dad, uh, the, the fellow who, the young fellow who had, uh, uh, we had seen earlier taking a picture of the old man from the rear. Uh, and so they gather about him and try to offer support. Uh, the names um, are bringing back memories. Uh, he is caught between two families, uh, the living family around him which supports him and a distant uh, deceased family alive now only in his mind. And uh, this particular family, uh, he is now biased toward and the, um, the film camera the, uh, tightens on his face, and particularly his eyes. And this dissolves into uh, a scene above on a landing ship uh, transport. Uh, we, we see uh, a transport thick with uh, soldiers. Uh, we notice from their outfits that this is uh, World War II. We get a print uh, on the screen saying that this is green, dog, dog green uh, uh, sector of Omaha Beach, uh, 1944. Uh, there are quite a few uh, uh, landing uh, transport uh, uh, ships uh, we see Tom Hanks, and uh, this devolving of uh, dissolving uh, of the old man's eyes into uh, this group had su suggested to me originally that he was an older version of uh, Tom Hanks' uh, character, uh, John Miller, Captain John Miller, but uh, uh, this is not correct, as it turned out. 
uh, we see uh, uh, Hanks in there. Uh, he is wearing. Uh, he, we, we notice the uh, captain bar bars on his um, a helmet. Uh, there are all kinds of other men there. Uh, there is some attempt uh, at um, uh, depicting faces and so forth. Uh, the composition of these uh, people is um, not really remarkable, uh, and uh, uh, the um, uh, sets and military uh, composition and mission and so forth, all of this is th are things that we've seen before and better. But at any rate, um, uh, we see the highest character with a canteen. He, he's trying to drink. We see his hands shaky. Uh, the first impression is that maybe he uh, has war jitters. Uh, he's uh, nervous about this thing, you know, and understandably so. Uh, we see other uh, individuals puking and um, uh, uh, various uh, indications of nervousness. Uh, Sergeant, uh, play by Sizemore, puts a big wad of tobacco in his uh, chewing tobacco into his uh, side of his mouth. Uh, uh, and uh, they're all uh, getting ready uh, the, as best they can. Some are praying, kissing crosses, making signs of the cross, and so forth. Um, the um, uh, film uh, yeah, shows the, the, the dropping of the front of the ship so that the troops could uh, go ashore. Uh, and it is at this point that uh, this incredible uh, fusillade uh, from the uh, Germans on the higher turf of the beach uh, cuts loose and uh, the carnage is amazing. Um, it just looks like uh, shooting uh, the old uh, fish in a barrel type of situation and uh, they all seem to be getting mowed down. Hank Sell uh, gives an order that they go over the side and they uh, start doing that, uh, those who are not already shot. And um, in the water they're being hit also and even underwater we see this. Uh, uh, the depiction uh, sometimes shows uh, uh, almost instantaneous spurts of blood, uh, red uh, in the uh, water, on, in these underwater scenes and so forth. Of course, I think in actual practice, uh, uh, whenever uh, someone is shot, there's a certain delay before the body starts pouring forth blood, uh, kind of a shock or something, which um, before the body organizes itself to, um, uh, to the wound. But at any rate, uh, uh, this uh, carnage is uh, unending uh, for those moments, uh, minutes of this opening. Uh, uh, and uh, we see arms and legs and uh, heads uh, blown off and stuff like this. And um, uh, it's a, a terrible scene um, and uh, fairly realistic. Uh, we see uh, some guy with his entire abdomen, it looks like, uh, blown out. Uh, holding his intestines and stuff. Uh, we see uh, and hear uh, men crawling, uh, calling out for their mothers and so forth, which uh, from my understanding is a pretty realistic uh, depiction of men uh, dreadfully wounded, uh, mortally wounded, know it. Uh, there is the frantic uh, effort by um, uh, medic uh, here and medic there to uh, save individuals. Um, uh, choices are quickly made. That guy's a goner. There's nothing you can do for him. I swear, just skip over it or something like this. Give him morphine and you run on. So, um, if, if they're getting mowed down so heavily, you wonder if any of them are going to survive. But um, Hanks and Sizemore and most of his little crew make it over eventually to um, uh, kind of a dune and uh, they're somewhat protected there. And from this, they start plotting out how to rub out the um, uh, main adversary, which is um, apparently a machine gun nest or two um, uh, above, uh, with a use of a, a small hand mirror, um, chewing gum uh, from Mellish and, uh, and whatnot, uh, put onto a bayonet. Uh, Hanks is able to spot uh, and give orders, uh, directional orders for the um, uh, termination of this uh, German location, uh, it's done. Uh, and they keep on moving and eventually uh, they overcome the, uh, the German lines which don't seem for all the ferocious shooting to be that well manned. Um, plus the Germans don't seem to be putting up much of a fight uh, on a hand-to-hand -hand basis. Uh, and uh, that's kind of unfortunate for them because uh, often enough they just shot down like dogs. Uh, and um, 
So that's another aspect of war, I guess you would say the me lie uh, instinct in man. But at any rate, um, uh, they are pretty much uh, rounded up and uh, largely massacred. Uh, tit for tat, you kill our guys, we kill you. Mm, there are uh, some are burnt up with uh, kind of flamethrower type of stuff. Um, and all in all, uh, uh, from either side of it, it looks like a, a pretty nasty uh, business. Um, so, but uh, the uh, U.S. finally secures this little piece of uh, turf, uh, apparently, and um, the Rangers, and um, uh, they, they find a few souvenirs. Uh, somebody brings up a, um, a, a knife, apparently some kind of souvenir from the Hitler Youth uh, movement or something like this, and uh, passes it to Mellish. Uh, as a sort of a trophy or something like this. Uh, and it's at this uh, time that we get a notion that Mellish is a uh, Jewish background. Uh, he uh, sort of breaks up uh, at the whole uh, uh, thought of it. Uh, we, we hear the word Holocaust uh, uh, issue uh, in some kind of uh, context. It's uh, not quite clear to me uh, exactly how this is uh, said, so it's, it's, but I, I believe um, uh, that the association is made with this uh, knife in the, in the Holocaust and so forth. Um, uh, and indeed, uh, if, if the Holocaust uh, uh, was as um, depicted and so forth uh, in uh, history books and films on, uh, on World War II and so forth, uh, Mellish would indeed have reason to uh, break up. Later, we get a, a look at the folks back home, uh, and they are um, uh, depicting uh, some women uh, who are at typewriters, apparently preparing letters to be sent to uh, uh, the uh, parents of uh, soldiers killed. Uh, and uh, there is one particular woman who um, seems to notice uh, something or other uh, that um, gets her interest. She leaves her position uh, with some papers and takes it to a, uh, a one-armed uh, colonel uh, uh, who is uh, her supervisor in this area. He, uh, she brings it to his attention. Uh, the matter is uh, basically that uh, three brothers named Ryan have all been killed in various parts of uh, the war theater, either in Europe or, Ge or Asia, um, the Pacific. Uh, and there are, um, there's one brother left who is also in the European scene uh, in the 101st Airborne. Uh, this particular woman had prepared three letters to uh, be sent to Ms. Ryan informing her of the death of sons. So uh, the, the attention is brought to the brass and goes all the way up to uh, General Marshall and uh, General George Marshall, the Chief of Staff uh, for the um, military, uh, studies this particular problem. He's advised by some uh, to just leave it be because uh, this other Ryan is probably a KIA that is killed in action, or um, uh, who knows where he is and all the confusion. Uh, it's a waste of men and manpower and time to send a, a detachment to go look for uh, this James Ryan. Uh, we get uh, some thoughtful uh, uh, this from uh, George uh, Marshall. He brings out a letter apparently uh, prepared by Abraham Lincoln to a uh, Massachusetts mother during the period of the Civil War uh, and reads that and she had sacrificed something like five or six sons in that effort. So um, uh, the decision is made to uh, save uh, the one uh, Ryan boy uh, if he could be found alive, and uh, to that effect, uh, orders were sent out to uh, retrieve him. Um, now, it seems to me that uh, the intelligent thing to do uh, in this kind of situation would be to send out a good, steadfast, uh, trustworthy uh, courier to uh, now find this guy, but um, uh, it was the chief of staff's notion that uh, you can't have too many uh, people looking, I guess. So they get uh, what's left of uh, uh, Captain John Marshall's uh, company, 
um, and he only has about uh, eight uh, really uh, trustworthy people from his point of view, uh, good sound soldiers he'd like to have with him. Uh, and uh, uh, the mission is given to them to go find this James Ryan. They, uh, they get uh, uh, an outsider uh, named Oppum, who is the translator, uh, can speak German and French uh, rather well, because uh, uh, Captain John Miller's own interpreters are six feet under now. Now, um, they get him in uh, the regular group, which is compare, composed of uh, the Jackson, that is the Barry Pepper character, Mellish, uh, the Edward Burns character, Rodman, um, a sergeant, uh, that's Tom Sizemore, uh, a guy named Capozo, um, and, and uh, a medic and, uh, uh, named Wade. Uh, and um, at any rate, they set out uh, to find this uh, James Ryan. Now, his men don't like the idea at all. Uh, they think it's really kind of stupid to uh, send out um, eight men and to risk their life for one. Uh, and uh, they do comment that each of them have their own mothers and so forth. But um, uh, Captain uh, John Miller says that uh, we'll go ahead and do the mission and so forth and we're going to save uh, Mrs. Ryan's last boy, and that's that. Skipping ahead now, they go on off and they learn that uh, uh, a James Ryan uh, is off with another group uh, near a certain town and whatnot, so they start heading there. Along the way, uh, on this final uh, part of the uh, film, um, they're in kind of a grassy, uh, rustic area. Suddenly, German vehicles come up. Uh, they hit the grass. Um, uh, the uh, vehicles are attacked uh, both by them and by some other people they didn't know. Well, after they have um, silenced the German uh, equipment and stuff like this, um, they uh, meet up with these other soldiers. It turns out they're 101st Airborne, and amongst them is this James Ryan, played by, play by uh, Matt Damone. Um, they uh, talk with him about uh, his situation, how he's lost his brother, brothers, and, and how uh, uh, Captain John Miller intends to take him back to uh, secured France uh, to be taken home uh, to his mother. Uh, as her uh, lone surviving son. Well, he, he thinks about this and so forth, but uh, he tells uh, uh, Hank's character finally that uh, although, you know, this is a great loss, the only uh, brothers that he has now are that little group of 101st Airborne uh, troops with whom he is now, and they have a mission to hold a particular bridge. There are like only two bridges uh, remaining over this particular river, and uh, these can be held against the Germans. Uh, it will stop a counterattack, and it's quite important, and so forth. So uh, they're going to stay. He says, I'm going to stay at least until reinforcements come here. I'm going to stay with uh, the 101st uh, fellows here. Well, um, Hanks uh, and the others kind of uh, understand that. Uh, Hanks goes and talks with Sizemore. What do you think about this? Well, on this hand and on that hand and so forth like this, they finally both decide that they, they just stay there and help the 101st uh, guys uh, control this bridge because they do also understand the big picture, scout out uh, the uh, approaching Germans um, and to advise. Uh, he uses kind of hand signals. You get the impression that both uh, Jackson and Hanks were baseball players uh, at some point in time and uh, understood the, uh, the kind of hand signals for the, uh, the German tanks into this uh, trap that they've set. Um, they're not altogether uh, successful with this, but uh, they do at least get one tank uh, and they try their jury rig bombs and they work apparently. Uh, there's all kinds of shooting the out man and stuff like this, so eventually uh, they are starting to get it. Uh, Oppen uh, was given the role as the uh, man who uh, carried the ammo, and particularly uh, the ammo for the machine guns, uh, one of which Mellish is operating. Um, Oppen turns out to get war nerves and to be totally incompetent uh, when the chips are down, it looks like. So that uh, uh, Mellish finds himself without um, uh, firepower. 
Jackson uh, has been uh, mowing him down as a sapper with his single shots and stuff like this while reciting his biblical verses. But uh, he eventually is blown apart uh, by um, a tank shot uh, to the tower he's in. So he's out of the picture. Uh, Sizemore gets in with three or four shots and um, uh, Mellish uh, is uh, finally caught in a hand-to-hand -hand combat with this very same German that they had let loose early on, the one who they think shot their medic Wade and uh, they wanted to kill, but which uh, uh, Tom Hanks character decided to let loose as a prisoner of war. Uh, and we see a hand-to-hand -hand, uh, combat uh, here. Uh, and Mellish eventually loses uh, to a bayonet uh, from the German, uh, who uh, then uh, goes back downstairs. And um, I will say one thing about this film I did not care for is that uh, there are parts which are done strictly in German, which uh, I and uh, the others who do not speak German, I have no idea what is being said, I can only guess and so forth. But Finally, uh, Hanks gets it uh, himself. We see him uh, sort of uh, go down, and uh, he draws out uh, a 45. Uh, this is an approaching tank, and he's shooting uh, this 45 at the tank. It was a uh, really a kind of a nice uh, suggestion of the futility of war. Uh, back from this scene to the old man at the cemetery, this idea of death associated with the flag.